Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this is a series of garden shows filmed for Norfolk Community Cable Television right here in my yard in Norfolk. We've been going through the whole garden season, and we're up to mid-October, and we're having some really unusual, beautiful, warm days for October. And this is giving me an opportunity, and I hope you too, to come outside and do a little garden work while things are pleasant to work outdoors. It isn't rainy, it isn't muddy, and it isn't cold, and that's my kind of weather. Uh, I'm gonna start taking down some of the things, even though we have not had a hard frost as of yet. We've had just a touch of frost two nights ago, but it's time to start taking the garden down because we will be getting it soon. I'm gonna trim back some of the herbs here in the herb garden that are finished, and this is the, the tarragon. And I'm just gonna trim it back. And compost the pieces. Also some of the oregano, most of it, because it tends to reseed in the lawn. I'll leave things that I would like to have reseed, or I'll collect their seeds to start next year. And a few more shoots of this one. And we'll just keep coming out and one by one taking some of these back, especially the ones I don't want to reseed. They're already forming their seed pods. This is the oregano, and it will reseed into the grass. It has already, it makes it nice to mow. It smells like pizza while you're mowing the grass, but I don't really want too much of it. Up here I have still a little of the globe basil, and it has not been killed by frost. It's pretty tender, and uh, much frost will kill it. This section tends to be a little higher than some of the lower areas in the yard. This parsley is going to seed. It's probably in its second year. I bought it as a plant. It's Italian parsley. And I'm going to let this form seeds and hopefully get out here with a plastic cup and collect them, and then I can plant them in my garden next year. After it's finished seeding, this parsley can be pulled because it will not come back up next year. So we can't count on that. I have another parsley in back. And that one is just in its first year because it hasn't attempted to go to seed yet. Since parsley is a biennial with a two-year cycle, I'll leave that one, put a little mulch on it, and hope that it comes up next spring again so that I can have some parsley in the spring from that plant. I'll do the same thing in the vegetable garden with the parsley I planted from seed this year. And many times they will come back and you can have very early parsley in the spring, which is nice, before the plant come up. It will then, once you have it in the garden for a while, it will go to seed next summer. The other thing I want to do is put away most of the plant labels. I have most of my herbs labeled and the labels last a lot longer if you store them inside over the winter. Otherwise, they tend to get kind of knocked over and the paint comes off. Uh, these are just purchase labels, and when they get a little uh, sad looking, I spray paint them with black paint in this case, or you can use any color you want, and then I paint the names of the herbs on them with a tiny brush and just white acrylic paint. Again, I'll store those in a little bucket in my garden shed over the winter. Any of the annuals, again, we have some calendula in here, which hopefully will, will go to seed right here so that I can have more blooms of it next year. It's starting to go to seed right now. And the scented geraniums, I've taken cuttings of those. So once they're gone, I'll pull those right out of the garden. The same with the lemon verbena and this basil, which again is still good and pickable. And uh, again, until we get a hard frost, We'll be able to pick many of these things, and some will even be available after we have a hard frost. That would be any times, sage. Sage can be used as long as it isn't covered with snow. And the mints are pretty much going to be gone when the first uh, frost hits. The southern woods I won't cut back 
definitely. And if I had rosemary out here that was of a more hardy variety, I wouldn't cut that back either right now. Nor will I cut back any of the lavenders until spring. These are uh, hardy plants, but they don't like to be cut back now. They might, uh, with this warm weather, start putting on new growth, and you wouldn't want that because it would be the first to go when it did frost. Other than that, the herb garden will sit here with oak leaves on it pretty much all winter and be mulched and will be ready to go in the spring. And hopefully we'll have some things like fennel that reseeds, some cilantro, and uh, possibly a basil. Every once in a while basil will reseed if you let it go to seed. And of course that parsley that I talked about may come up from seedlings. So I'll have to watch out when I'm weeding next spring and see if those come up. We planted the saffron crocuses last time. Fortunately, nothing has disturbed them, and they will just stay there over the winter and come up with foliage in the spring, though it won't have blooms until next fall. Now let's move over to the perennial garden. Most of the blooms in the perennial garden are gone now. There are still a few chrysanthemums left on the other side, and others are going to seed, or the leaves are turning color. The grasses are in bloom had bloomed but again the seed heads on the grasses will stay all winter. We still have a few of the verbena bonariensis here and there and that too is going to seed. Hopefully it will come up. It's a semi-hardy annual and uh, it tends to come up from seed although I've had some of the patches come up again next year. Uh, we continue the clean up in here I'm not going to clean up everything. I leave some because the pollinators tend to overwinter and butterfly chrysalises are in with the debris uh, along the edges of the plants under the leaves. Uh, leaving some is helpful to keep the pollinators in your garden and that's what you want is to have some of them there. Some of the things I will cut back, the ones that are messy to deal with in the spring, uh, iris in particular, and that also likes to be kept a little drier. And if you leave the wet leaves on it, it tends to stay wet. And now it's time to plant some spring blooming bulbs. And I'm going to plant some crocus here. And the idea is if you uh, kept a nice list last spring, hopefully you did, of where things were planted and where you needed to plant things, you'll know that uh, you have some spots to put in those tulips, crocuses, daffodils, all of the spring flowering bulbs. I'm going to put in uh, half a or about five crocuses. I tend to buy them in packages of ten and a group of five gives a good view. I have trouble with chipmunks and crocuses. And I'm sure other people do too. I'm going to dig down about five or six inches. And then I'm going to add some... This is stone dust or very fine gravel. I'm going to plant my seeds in it. Supposedly the chipmunks do not like to dig in the gravel. So if you have any gravel, that's a good use. And I'll just make a little circle of them. Then I'm going to add some gravel over the top of them, too. They should be able to come right up through this, but it may discourage some of the digging rodents. Then I'll just pack the dirt on over them. Have a few weeds to add. And pack it down well. And then on the very top of this bunch, I'm going to put two grape hyacinths. Then I'll know that I've planted something there when I see a very small bunch of the grape hyacinths. I have a, a lot of them and they have foliage right now so you can find them to dig them up. This will get watered and mulched and before I mulch I'm going to add another th rodent deterrent and that's some cayenne pepper and uh, hopefully that will get them sneezing and they will decide to move elsewhere to do their digging. So I'll just put a little of that on top you could also put some down in with the bulb itself. Hopefully that will help the creatures 
stay away from the uh, crocuses. They seem to be a favorite with the chipmunks in my yard. Some people have more trouble with voles and moles. Chipmunks are the ones that are here. Again, we also can uh, empty pots. This is a uh, Nicotiana that I had planted in a pot. It's done. And I'll just empty the pot, yep, the pot. And this will all go into the compost. And we can also pick up any plant supports and store those away. Just a general neatening up of the garden. And uh, these will store about like this. And I do hang these up behind my compost pile. So that and the pot will come up to the compost pile a little later. I'll make a whole uh, collection of these plant supports and bring them in as I cut the plants down. The aster blooms have already gone by. And of course this plant or two will get emptied. Some years I leave it out and fill it with Christmas greens for a decoration. I can uh, actually move the whole support around to another spot in the garden or leave it right here. It just adds a little interest. I'll just take the plants out of the planter because uh, they will go when it, we do have a frost. I may replant this uh, dianthus right into the garden because it may, especially if I put it in a sheltered spot, come up next spring and bloom. I've had dianthus come back rather dependably. I'll probably move it right in front of my patio windows in the back so that uh, it gets some sun and is sheltered a little bit. This is the empty pod of the uh, butterfly weed. Very much like milkweed, I have several others over here that actually you can see the pods being very much like milkweed. And I could actually save these seeds. They're attached to their fluff that's flying around, but you can remove the fluff and just save the little seeds if you wish. Plant them and then you'll be able to plant the seedlings next spring. Or you can leave them where they are to perhaps come up. The next thing I want to do is plant some lilies. And since these are tall, I'm going to put them up near the fence. I haven't had as much problem with chipmunks with lilies, so I'm not going to put gravel in these. These are Asiatic lilies, or I'm sorry, these are Oriental lilies. The lilies that are already in this area that have bloomed and been cut back are Asiatic lilies, which bloom in July, uh, early to mid-July. These, on the other hand, the Oriental lilies bloom a little bit later. So this will give me a group of lilies that will be blooming for a longer period of time by having two varieties in the same area. These are mixed colors. I don't know what they'll be. We'll find out next year. And I'm just going to put these in about six to eight inches down. And you can see the roots on these, so we'll put the roots down. And they came packed in a little peat moss, which I'll just add to the hole. Plant them in a little triangular formation and fill in with the dirt. Planting bulbs is the hardest part is uh, digging the hole. And we have a few of the other lilies right here, I believe. Again, we'll cover those and be sure to mulch them. And I'm going to put in, again, a couple of the grape hyacinths just so that I mark the spot. It's very hard to know in a mature garden where to put things if you already have lots of things in it as far as bulbs go. 
it seems like if you don't keep track of where to put them, you go to dig the hole and you end up digging out bulbs that are already there. This garden is getting quite filled with them, so I really do need to keep track so I know where I want to put them. Some people use golf tees, and next year I may try that. Uh, where you want a bulb, you put a different color golf tee, and that will tell you what to plant. Perhaps yellow for daffodils, red for tulips, blue for crocuses. If you can find a, an assorted color set of golf tees, they work quite well. They're unobtrusive during the season, but they can show up in the fall when you need them. Again, there are tender annuals in here, uh, lemon verbena. I will not cut back the chrysanthemums. I may take, cut back the individual blooms, but I'll leave them standing and then we'll be putting leaves and baskets on them for the winter so that they will return next year. This one probably can stand to be divided next year and more chrysanthemum put somewhere else. This is the pineapple sage and you can see that it's been tipped by frost, just the edges. Unfortunately, this plant blooms very late and it's in bloom right now. So I definitely, even though it's been tipped by frost, we'll leave it for a while. We're uh, scheduled to have about a week to 10 days of above average weather with no more frost. So I'll leave this plant and let it continue to bloom. It really is, has pretty red blooms on it that uh, I like very much. And I wish it would bloom about a month earlier because a lot of times it never even makes it before we have a frost. Grasses are in bloom. We're getting the last of the roses, probably one or two blooms. Uh, again, with the warm weather, the plants are a little bit confused and some of them are starting to think they should bloom again, that maybe they uh, missed the winter. But we know they didn't, so again, we'll uh, be cutting stuff back. Peonies get cut back to help prevent uh, disease. Peonies are very susceptible to mildew, so it's good to cut them back so that they won't have this wet foliage in the spring when they start to come up again. So those will be cut back before the month is over. Uh, we can enjoy the sedum all through the winter. The blooms stay on the plant. They will turn into a brown, but they still look very nice when they're covered with snow. Uh, just gives a little interest to the garden, as do some of the other things, the rose bushes and other plants that we leave standing, like grasses. Now let's head on over to the vegetable garden and see what we can do there. I'm in the vegetable garden and some of the things have already been removed from the garden. They were finished. The peppers, the eggplants, some of the basil got hit by the frost. Uh, these nasturtiums have been lightly frosted and again, they can be picked any time. They really went wild this year, but we'll just pick those and add them to the compost gradually because they're pretty much finished. All the squash plants have been picked. And again, uh, I, because of the danger of spreading any diseases with that type of plant, the cucumbers and the squash plants went in the trash instead of the compost. But any of these flowers, the borage is still going strong. And it's uh, one that the bees are still enjoying. And we've had a lot of uh, bubble bees and honey bees around the borage, so I'll leave that as long as possible. Uh, someone in the area must have a beehive because we've had lots and lots of honeybees here all summer. And uh, I enjoy having them to pollinate my plants as well. I still have plenty of parsley to pick. And again, I'll leave that in hopes that it comes up next spring. On cool nights, I have celery that I've been covering because it again is a tender crop. I haven't even picked my parsnips yet. I like to wait until after a frost. Both kale and parsnips and even broccoli get sweeter after it's had a frost. It will live quite a long time until there's a really, really, really hard freeze. And you can enjoy harvesting it probably this year until Thanksgiving time. We'll just have to wait and see what the weather is. The zinnias, on the other hand, and the uh, 
cosmos, they were hit by the frost and need to be pulled rather soon. The uh, lemon mint, which was a new plant for me this year, is still blooming and looking really nice. Uh, again, it's attracting pollinators, as are the calendulas behind them. My leeks, I've been taking care of all summer, and it's finally time to pick them. They, too, will increase in sweetness after a bit of a frost, but we can probably fork some up now. And we have a nice-looking leek, which we can take in and uh, cut up and use in soup or just to saute with some other vegetables. Uh, I really had good luck with these leeks this year. I think it was because I used a lot of compost uh, around them when I planted them and kept them moist all summer. I picked shallots earlier in the season and some of them were really small. So I thought I'm going to replant them and have them come up again next spring. So I div I've divided them. I think I started out with six plants and I've got eight here and we already have harvested and used some of the ones that I had before. So I'm going to put those in the ground. I've already dug a little trench here and I turned over the soil in this row with the fork and added a little uh, fertilizer and I'm just going to poke these down in about six inches apart. and add soil. Now these may do a little growing this fall, especially with the warm temperatures. But I will put uh, some straw mulch on them, around them and over them, which will stay for the winter. I will leave the row marked, however, so we won't inadvertently rototill this row. That would not be a good idea. I'm going to mark the row with a stake. And the next thing I'll plant here is garlic. We had a good crop this year, and uh, garlic has been a, a great crop for me. And I have basically three cloves of uh, German red garlic that I purchased. And the idea is to break these apart into individual cloves. And again, plant them about six inches apart, pushing them down into the soil. You want them several inches deep. Garlic is a pretty trouble-free plant to grow. We'll harvest this about the end of July next year. And out of these three cloves, I should have enough garlic. Each one of these cloves will make another whole head of garlic. And I may have enough to last until February or March. Cover this over well. Pat it down. And again, I will put a good mulch of straw over this garlic for winter. And it may come up through the straw this fall, depending on how warm it is. That's okay, it'll be just fine. Uh, it'll die back and then come up again in the spring. And we'll look forward to seeing it come up in the spring. I'll repeat this with the other cloves that I have, and then probably also use a couple of the cloves that I harvested.
I'm still able to harvest my perpetual spinach. Again, I mentioned broccoli. I find the best broccoli sometimes is after a frost because those darn cabbage moths are gone and you don't have any of the caterpillars on the, bar on the broccoli. Perpetual spinach. I have kale, a few beets, a few carrots left. Some scallions that I had planted from seed. We're enjoying using those. And believe it or not, if we can have the camera turn around a little bit, I still have cherry tomatoes. I can pick a few almost every day with this warm weather, and they're still really tasty. This is the kale, and it will continue to grow. I have some young kale over on the other side, and hopefully that will come up again next spring. So I'm going to leave that and see. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. If it does, we'll have a very early season of some kale plants. It's always worth a try. I am in the process of removing my strawberry plants because it's time for new ones. I'll be ordering my new strawberry plants, which will arrive at the proper planting time in the spring, and we will put them in a different location. So part of uh, even planting the garlic is already working on next year's garden. Uh, I will need to decide where I'm going to put the strawberries since they will be in the garden for probably four or five years before they get moved and plan to put other things in different locations from where they were a year ago. This helps with the insect problems to keep them rot rotated and also different plants use different nutrients from the soil so by rotating them around the garden they kind of get a chance to get what they need each year. We will be putting some grass clip, or not grass clippings, but leaf, shredded leaves from the lawnmower on the garden and then tilling them in later, later on when the leaves have come down. Right now we uh, still have lots of leaves on the trees that haven't even turned yet, so it's going to be later before we have any ground leaves to put on the garden. I can also add any compost to areas that need compost or that I think need a little enrichment. We sent in the soil sample last time that uh, I did a show and that has not returned yet. So once it returns, we'll know if we need to add some lime or perhaps another uh, nutrient to the soil and let it work its way in for this winter. Again, we uh, mulch as much as we can with the leaves into the grass but the, some of the leaves will come onto the garden, others will get composted. And pine needles we have in abundance, and they are my paths. So we renew the pine needles on the paths each year. I have a dahlia and a canna here. I had uh, pumpkins here. I still have a little tomato, a uh, pear tomato, and it's still bearing too. We're still using the pear tomatoes, and I've still got a little basil here and there that's still good. This is a canna lily and it has had a just a tinge of frost but not a lot as has this dahlia which has been blooming like crazy. We still have a few blooms over here even though it's uh, kind of falling down in places. Once the foliage on this has blackened and also the canna lilies and I have some scattered around the garden those will be dug and they'll be stored in peat inside in a cool spot. I don't have a cellar that's cool, so I do have an unused bedroom that uh, we don't heat much in the winter. It gets the least heat. It's on a zone that isn't often used. So they'll go into that bedroom where the temperature stays under 60 usually. And uh, so far they've done pretty well using that. Behind me is some broom corn that I planted, and it's ripening up, and the seed heads are very decorative. Uh, you don't get any corn off of this, but the broom corn is actually the seed heads are what can be, were once used to make brooms, I believe. But it's, uh, I grow it pretty early because it's decorative, and uh, within the month I'll be cutting that and using it decoratively in a bunch in some of my winter and fall decorations. Now let's head out to the back to the shade garden.
This planter started out with cuttings that I took last year and I've taken cuttings again to be used next year. These two plants are, are Plectoranthus, which is often used as a house plant, but also used as an annual outside. This is a ginger, uh, tender ginger plant, and I've never had it bloom, but uh, I grow it for the foliage. And this again is another canna, and it's in bloom way up there. This started out just as a tiny bulb in the ground the end of June, and you can see it has gotten very tall looking for the sun. The Plectoranthus, the blue one, blooms in the fall and is one of the few blue flowered things that you can have in your fall garden. It, uh, I think it's pretty attractive. I've put a few uh, perennials in here just to see how they do since it's a huge pot. and. So far, I have a hosta in here that's done well. And this year I added a grass and a brunera. And we'll see if they continue. Also some, uh, some of this uh, foliage plant ground cover, the ajoka, and we'll see how that does. Let's move back then to the pond area. Frost has not hit this garden yet. It's a little more protected by the trees and shrubs around it. Uh, I will, however, start cutting back things like hosta, which are getting pretty nasty looking, uh, and remove them from the garden. I've had a problem with slugs this year, and I really don't want to encourage their overwintering. So I will also use my leaf blower and get as many of the leaves out of here as I can to deny them some hiding places. I'll leave the ferns. The ferns just kind of disintegrate on their own. And of course, the hellebores continue to stay green all winter. They're evergreen, as is the Lacothwe, which is behind me, and some of the other shrubs, the mountain laurel and the rhododendron. This grass will turn to a uh, brown color, and the little seed heads will stay here all fall. Usually by now it is brown, but uh, kind of a golden brown color. But this year it is not. I've put net on the pond. If you have fish in your pond, and this year we did not have fish in our pond. We will next year, I hope. But uh, the mechanics for the pond, the waterfall, the filtration unit and the pump will all be removed probably this weekend, and brought into the house for the winter. Uh, they last a lot longer if you don't leave them out, and especially where they're made of a plastic type material. If they have water in them that freezes, it will ruin them. So you definitely don't want to leave them out. The pump is put into a bucket of water. Uh, in order to keep its seals moist, it is required to stay in water, so I just put it in a bucket. It goes in the furnace room and stays there until spring. I'll leave the net on only until the leaves have all come down and been removed. And then I'll remove the net and put it away. Uh, I found one year I left it all winter and the snow weighted it down and it was quite a mess by the time spring came. So I've learned that uh, the net needs to be removed. It also breaks the net if it gets covered with snow and weighted down. All of the flowers along the edge, once they're killed by frost, which won't be too long, the uh, impatience and the coleus that's in this pot, these will go with the frost and again the pots will be emptied and put away in the shed as will the planters and will be ready for winter. The chair stays out simply because I don't have any space to put it inside and still be able to use the shed which I use for craft work. Because of its sunny windows when it's closed on a sunny day it really warms up in there. It uh, approaches 80 degrees many days in the winter, even though it's only about 40 outside because of the sun. However, once the sun goes down, the temperature falls like a rock, and at night it will go below freezing. Therefore, I can't really keep plants out here until spring, and the temperatures at night are more in the 40s to 50s instead of the 20s and 30s. Again, continue to deer spray. That's something I 
find I need to do all year long. Deer won't eat Lakothway. I seldom have trouble with my rhododendrons. I sometimes spritz them anyway. I have a few young rhododendrons. They will eat the fresh young foliage of rhododendrons. We don't have to spray the hosta anymore. It's cut back. But if you have any holly, they particularly like that and uh, will munch on the holly. I don't know why. They, they say it's not deer uh, friendly, but I've had the holly attacked by the deer several times, so I make sure to spray that. And also some of the evergreens, particularly used in Arbovita. They will eat those. You know which plants they eat in your yard if you've had experience. Make sure you keep those plants sprayed with a deer deterrent and hopefully you won't lose any big plants over the winter. Now let's go inside and see what we can cook with the last of the harvest and plan a little for Halloween, which is coming up in the next few weeks. Today we're going to use some of the things from the garden, but we're also going to make some Halloween things. And there's a lot of Halloween stuff on the internet. Uh, I go to Pinterest a lot to look at various things and recipes. And some of the food is downright scary. I'm not really into the really uh, creepy Halloween type food. Uh, some of it is a little scary indeed. But some that's on the cute side, I do like for Halloween, especially if you have small children. You don't want to creep them out. You just want to have something cute and special for Halloween because it is one of the kids' favorite holidays. Today I'm going to be making some butterscotch brownies, and I have melted a quarter cup of butter, and I'll add a cup of brown sugar. I think we need something to help it out. And I'm adding that to the butter and we want to dissolve that in it and it got a little hard since I put it in the dish. So we'll break that up a bit. There we've mixed that into the melted butter. This is a really easy cookie recipe and I think they're a really nice fall treat. I'm adding one egg and a half teaspoon of vanilla. Get a measuring cup here. And measure a cup of flour. I guess we had a cup of flour, just about. There we are, a cup of flour. And a teaspoon of baking powder and a half quarter teaspoon of salt. I'll mix that in well. And then I'll add half a cup of toasted chopped walnuts. You can leave those out if you wish, but I think they make it good. Let's put these things over here. Put them in a greased eight inch pan. And I'm gonna spread this out, get it into the corners. A nice even layer. And then I'll put this in the oven for about 25 minutes at 350. And 
and set the timer. The next thing I'm going to make is uh, some Halloween mummy corn dogs. And I have in this uh, bowl some mashed potato flakes, two thirds cup. And I have two thirds cup of hot water, which I'm going to add and stir it around until the potato flakes absorb it. At which point I'll add a third of a cup of shortening. Probably also use coconut oil, which is uh, rather firm like this. And I'll stir that into the potatoes. One cup and a quarter of flour. Two tablespoons of sugar. Uh, I need to check my recipe here for the amount of baking powder. Four teaspoons of baking powder and a half teaspoon of salt. Half a cup of cornmeal. I'll mix that in a bit until it gets kind of crumbly. This is kind of like a biscuit dough. You could use canned biscuits or you could use crescent rolls. I've seen them done with crescent rolls, but I thought it would be fun to have corn dogs. A little more substantial. And I'll add a half a cup of milk. These are good just baked as a, a scone or a biscuit as well. Just uh, roll it and cut it, or pat it out in the pan and cut it in, in triangles. It's very nice with soup have something like this. I'm going to bring over my pastry cloth, a little flour, and put the dough out on the cloth, and then get rid of a few dishes. I want to knead this dough a few times just to make sure everything's well mixed. And then I'll roll it out and I'm going to roll it fairly thin. If I were making biscuits I'd leave it about a quarter inch or more, maybe a half inch to cut them. But for this we want it a little thinner. I'm going to use my knife and cut strips, probably about a quarter inch wide, quarter to half inch. And I have hot dogs, which are dry, any type of sausage you like. Chicken sausage would work. Now I'll wrap a little around the top and then a little more around the body and we'll make it kind of uneven even so he's wrapped up like a mummy the idea is you want to cover the top and leave a little bit for his face to stick out in the middle. Neatness is not necessary. And we'll keep wrapping. I'd like to do a few more of these. Okay, we'll continue bandaging this guy up and then we're ready to put them in the oven. Make sure we have that little space left. 
and they're ready to go in. And these go into a 400 degree oven for about 15 minutes. I'm gonna be sure and set the timer on these. Now, we're going to make some frosting. Uh, magic of TV, we already have one of the butterscotch brownies already made. And I've browned some butter and I'm going to reheat it. Uh, it takes a while to brown butter and you want it to be nice and light brown and it'll have some little flecks in it. So I'm going to strain it into my frosting. This is a brown butter frosting that's going to go on these brownies. And we're remelting. You basically just cook a quarter cup of uh, butter, the same as we did for the brownies themselves. So the brownies plus frosting will use a whole stick of butter. Only this one you would let continue to cook until it becomes a nice light golden brown. There you can see that it's uh, a golden color. This takes five to seven minutes, which is why I already have done it. But I do have a lot of little flecks in it, and unless I really want flecks in my frosting, what I'm going to do is strain it into my sugar. And you can see the little flecks that have come out. I'm still going to have that nice brown butter flavor. But I won't have the flecks of brown in the frosting. I'll press them a little bit to get all of the butter out. I'm going to add a half teaspoon of, or a, I'm sorry, a teaspoon of vanilla. This is two cups of confectioner's sugar. And a couple tablespoons of cream. And I guess I need my tablespoon. Start out with two. And you can also use milk if you prefer. And we'll mix this in to make a frosting. May have to add a little more of the cream. Probably at least another tablespoon. Depends uh, on the humidity in your room. It's been pretty dry of late. Therefore, the sugar, the confectioner's sugar, would be dry. And that looks pretty smooth. Normally this would be done in the pan, however my pan is still in the oven with the second batch of butterscotch brownies. So I turned this one out on the cutting board, which makes it easier to cut, which I will do right now. I'm going to cut this into 16 pieces, so I'll cut it in half. And in half again. Cut those all in half. Knife would be less messy if we let the frosting sit a little bit before we did the cutting. 
but we wanted to not take the time to do that right now. I'm going to finish these off with a Halloween pumpkin in each one so that they're a little more festive. Again, the frosting will set up until it's fairly firm, firm enough that you can wrap them if, if you're taking them someplace for a Halloween party. And I'll put those up that way. They're finished. Now for a little hors d'oeuvre. I've done some deviled eggs, but we're going to uh, add a little Halloween to them. Using some black olives, we're going to make spider eggs. And it's a matter of putting a black olive and then using some of the pieces of the black olive for spider legs. This is about as creepy as I get for Halloween. And I like spiders, so. I'm just going to keep doing these. I put a few of the calendulas in the middle of the plate. I like to use uh, edible flowers for decoration. All right, there are our spider eggs. If you wanted, you could uh, dot each one with a little of the mustard for eyes. Some mustard here and a toothpick. When I make my deviled eggs, I like to add a little dry mustard to the mix. So having a little mustard on top is kind of representative of what's in it. Not a lot, just a little. We'll have some facing one way and some facing the other. To serve with our Dogs. I'm going to make a salad using some of the arugula from the garden. Our arugula, I've planted numerous plantings this year. We like it as a salad green. It's got a little pungent taste, but it does hold up really well to cool weather, which means in the spring and in the fall, it's excellent. It also will hold up to the heat in the summer, so you can have arugula as a salad green almost all summer, and it is a healthy green. I'm going to make a little salad with some of the yellow plum tomatoes. Usually you see this salad done with red tomatoes and green basil. Today I'm going to use yellow tomatoes, which I've sliced up, these little yellow pears. Make a couple salads. Finish them up. Again, this is about almost the end of the season on fresh garden tomatoes. Always sad to see it go, but it will come around again next year before we know it. Then I add, these are cut up pieces of mozzarella cheese. This is a fresh mozzarella, which is very soft and good. And some of the red basil. This is the last of the red basil. I picked it before the little frost a few nights ago. Cut it up and put it in the refrigerator. It's a change from the green basil of the summer. And then I've added two tablespoons of olive oil, nice flavorful olive oil, and one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. And I'll just drizzle that over each of the salads. And 
and it's time to take out our mummy dogs. Mummy corn dogs. The uh, hot dogs or any sausage you use should be fully cooked because uh, we're not making them long enough to fully cook a sausage. Most of the hot dogs are fully cooked. So I'm going to give these guys some eyes too with a little mustard and then we'll serve some extra mustard with them. Mummy corn dogs with mustard. And then we need some sort of drink to go along with this. So we'll have some uh, dragon's blood cocktail, which uh, is pomegranate juice. We'll put a little of that in the bottom of each of the glasses. And then you could add Prosecco or Champagne if you wished, or more likely for me, some ginger ale. And we can call that our Dragon's Blood cocktail to go along with our meal here. And we have some other things if you're having a party. I made up some uh, Halloween Munch and Crunch. And I'm going to move things together a little bit here. And this was a cereal mixture with Reese's Pieces, candy corn, those little candy pumpkins like we used uh, on top of the cakes, and pretzels and trumpet snacks and the, the pretzels, trumpets, and corn checks were baked with a brown sugar butter mixture at a, in a low oven and then the other candies were added once it cooled. I've also made some Halloween pretzels. These are just pretzels that have been dipped in white chocolate or white chocolate bits. The uh, Dipping bits that you can find at the craft store work really well because they harden up almost instantly. And then I use some of the decorations, again, from the craft store or the grocery store to decorate them. I've done them for several events and used different decorations for each one. This is a last of the garden flower arrangement. And I just went out before I thought it was going to frost the other night and picked everything I could. And I wanted to see what we had, try to put a good face forward on it. A little of the pineapple sage, the rest of the zinnias, which are now gone, and uh, some of the lemon mint. I wasn't sure if that would make it or not. It happened to make it, but it doesn't always, so I did pick some of that as well. You also need a costume for your Halloween party. So I have the witch's hat to go with it. And that makes a good table decoration. Let's rearrange things a little here. Then we have a little Halloween supper here with uh, mummy corn dogs, some end of the summer salad, uh, Capri salad, butterscotch brownies for an hors d'oeuvre, some spidery deviled eggs, and a few snacks along the way for trick-or-treaters. I'm Liz Davey. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. Join me again as we go through the garden year and do some cooking for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm.